overview before we pass over to some very special guests today. Um, first of all, my name is Richard Keane. Uh, I lead the Innovation, Legislation and Education branch over here in Department of Agriculture and soon to be Forestry and Fisheries, I think, starting um, beginning of uh, 1 July. Um, but before we meet, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands on which we meet. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting on. Um, in Canberra, it's the Ngunnawal people. I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and contribution they make to the life of this city and the region. I extend that recognition to the traditional custodians of all other lands on which our staff and participants are gathered today and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending today's event. I think I just mentioned it before, but um, for everyone that's uh, dialed in, please make sure that you've got your, your microphones on mute um, and, and cameras are off. It'll just make it easier for navigating. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, so unfortunately my uh, stuffy nose is going to be recorded for posterity, but um, it'll be available if anyone wants to, to listen and, and play back. Um, there is the interactive capability here as well, so you can put in any comments that you um, that you want our um, guest presenters to answer. Um, however, there will be an opportunity at the end and you can just use the um, put your hand up um, capability and we'll navigate through that. <coughs> um, as a bit of a recap, I think everyone should know the, the Centre of Excellence for Biosecurity Risk Analysis, or SEBRA. It's a long-standing biosecurity research initiative and it plays a vital role in providing the Australian and New Zealand governments with expert biosecurity risk analysis and advice that helps inform a range of biosecurity risk management activities. Today's SEBRA, as we're branding them, uh, will be undertaken by SEBRA for New Zealand MPI on identifying opportunities for improving import risk analysis, production efficiency, and pilot testing of selected opportunities. To explain more on this topic, it is my pleasure today to introduce today's presenters. We've got Dr. Tim Van Gelder and Dr. Ariel Kruger, who you can see on your screens there, um, from the Hunt Laboratory for Intelligence Research at the Uni of Melbourne. Dr. Van Gelder is the director of the Hunt Laboratory. He is an applied epistemologist with experience in pure research, software development, consulting and training. He has worked with DOOR, soon to be DAF, and New Zealand MPI um, since 2015, developing and providing training in the presentation of reasoning in reports. Dr Kruger is a research fellow at the Hunt Laboratory and for the last few years has been working with SEBRA and New Zealand MPI. His background is in the philosophy of science and research interests um, are Intel analysis, biosecurity and applied epistemology. Got better that time, didn't I? Um, New Zealand's MPI research team for this work is Sarah Sapsford, Michael Kuchar and Andreas Macchiola and Michael Ormsby, who will be joining us from uh, Wellington uh, for the Q&A session that will be after this presentation. So anything that you want, put in the chat bar or at the end, we'll, um, we'll do a bit of a round table. But without further ado, I'll get over to Drs Tim and Ariel now to take it away. I'm hoping everyone can see the screen. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rich. Uh, uh, this is, I'm, I'm Tim, Tim Van Gelder, and uh, uh, I'll uh, say a few words at the start, and I'll say uh, a few words at the end, and uh, the bulk of it will be Ari, who is, has indeed done, done the bulk of the research um, in, this, in this project. Uh, I'll just uh, add a couple of points to the um, to the fairly comprehensive introduction there. Uh, one is that the Hunt Lab for Intelligence Research, um, our, our focus is on intelligence analysis, uh, but uh, we are technically sort of bureaucratically part of this of SEBRA. Uh, we're, we're under the SEBRA umbrella, and we have a lot of overlap of interests and expertise, and we work uh, on joint projects. So it, it's a very good relationship, and sort of explains how people from the Hunt Lab are, are involved in this particular project. Um, uh, thanks for mentioning the, the working group at, at New Zealand MPI who've been, um, have had a lot of great input into this. I'll also mention that we've had um, uh, some excellent assistance from Wendy Odges at DOOR, and I understand that she's moved on or moving on very soon, but, uh, but she has uh, helped us a lot with a DOOR perspective on these issues. So we've presented, uh, we've prepared a, a pretty high level uh, overview. We'll, we'll try to get it th through it fairly quickly and um, allow us time for 
uh, some discussion. And of course, there will be fairly soon, that is, we're fairly late in the project now. Uh, our next major task really is, is to start writing, you know, uh, submitting a, a, a draft final report. So that will should be available, all going well in, in a few months. And um, that will contain a lot more detail if you have appetite for that. So uh, I'll assume, uh, Ari, if you could go to the next slide, that um, for everybody in this audience, uh, you'll be familiar with import risk analyses and, and where they sit in the, the landscape uh, for for an organisation like New Zealand MPI and DOOR. And uh, you'd also, I think, be pretty well aware that import risk analyses are, are, are fairly major efforts, right? There's a, they're, they're large, complex scientific documents. They take a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of time um, to develop. And uh, they... Uh, uh, consequently, you know, there's a fair resource, uh, investment of resources that, that, that's needed. And that fact, combined with some of what's happening in the larger environment, uh, if you go to the next slide, Ari, um, means that actually at New Zealand MPI, there is a pretty large backlog of IRAs that uh, need to be completed or indeed need to be started. Uh, before uh, trade can commence in, in many commodities. And so uh, I won't belabor the point. Um, it'd be nice if that backlog was cleared, you know, everybody would be happier. Uh, and so uh, it's uh, it's partly a matter of resources, but it's partly a matter of, uh, you know, th there's just a lot of demand for these, these risk analyses. Uh, there are a lot of commodities, a lot of pests. Um, the scientific knowledge base is changing. The, the, uh, the, the distribution of pests around the world uh, is changing. Global trade is is increasing, although uh, current recession might put a little bit of a damper on that. So you, you would, I think, all well understand that the, the factors that mean that this task isn't looking like it's going to get any any easier as things go forward. So so how do we reduce that backlog? Yeah, that's the key question. Uh, one obvious thought is, well, we need more analysts, you know, we need more staff. Uh, and, you know, that's, there are obviously challenges in, in taking a simple approach like that. So what we've addressed is, hmm, assuming staffing and resources is fixed, how can we be more efficient? Uh, and in particular, how can we be more efficient without compromising the quality of the import risk analyses? And now, uh, this is, of course, is not a new question. Uh, NZMPI and DOOR and, and other similar organisations have, have always been considering this issue. And many things have been done in the past to improve efficiency. And so, so we're not you know, trying to do anything sort of radically new here, uh, but, but we are trying to take stock of the situation, try and gather what's known and uh, pull it together into, Ari, if you go into the next slide, uh, into some specific so implementable ideas for New Zealand MPI, in addition to anything they're already doing to improve efficiency. So our overall process has been, uh, uh, we started out by, by conducting a, a survey, and that was to get some, some what they call base knowledge, right? Just uh, what does it take to produce an IRA, for example? I mean, how many hours, how many analysts, how many resources, um, how many, uh, what, what size is the backlog? And, and you know, questions, basic questions like that. Um, plus, uh, getting some ideas uh, from, uh, from practicing biosecurity risk analysts and managers. That fed into uh, the next phase, which was the development of a map of what we understand to be all the realistic opportunities that, are in some sense in front of an organization like uh, MPI or DOOR. Uh, so we prepared that map and then we had a workshop with MPI where we said, Here's, here, here are all the options. What do we think are the most um, you know, uh, feasible for MPI to, to start taking further? And uh, those, those are in two categories. One, an actionable opportunity, a low hanging fruit, something we can start on pretty much right away and uh, and that in, indeed there is one that we that is being piloted at the moment. Uh, Ari will talk about you know these things. And a it, no, it's unlikely that the low hanging fruit will be 
uh, a major opportunity. It might make some useful difference, but if, if we're going to make a sort of really quantum, to use that uh, jargony word, uh, quantum shift here, then it's, it's likely to be not an easy or obvious thing and, uh, and might take quite a bit longer and more resources to, to implement. And so we come up with this, uh, this notion of a structured drafting environment for IRA uh, production. So um, that's the big picture. Uh, that's where I'll um, sort of uh, hand over to Ari, who will talk through in more detail just what this uh, process was. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start with the, the first step in our process, which was the, uh, the survey. Um, we decided to develop a survey and send it out to as many biosecurity organizations as we could. Um, and that would provide us with kind of the information we needed to get started. Uh, first, it would be helpful for us to know um, what analysts and managers are really spending their time doing. Um, as a toy example, if it turns out, you know, that 90% of analysts' time is spent looking for, I don't know, stationary, uh, then it wouldn't make sense for us to suggest something else. Um, we'd be better off suggesting, you know, an easy to reach fixed location to find stationary. Uh, and by learning where analysts and managers are spending their time, we'd, we'd learn where the biggest uh, efficiency gains could be had. Um, secondly, we wanted to ask explicitly uh, what analysts and managers believe are the biggest impediments to efficient IRA production. Um, and finally, while our research team did have some ideas of their own from um, a survey of the, of the literature, um, it would be very helpful for us to know what uh, analysts and managers at these organizations uh, think might be good ideas for improving efficiency. Um, so through various channels, uh, we managed to invite and, and recruit 48 analysts and managers from nine different biosecurity organizations to take part in the survey. Um, now, since the project was commissioned by NZMPI, we were, of course, mainly interested in the NZMPI responses. But casting a, a wider net would expose us to a, a larger variety of challenges and ideas. Uh, the majority of respondents, as we expected, uh, were from DOOR and NZMPI. But we were you know, pleasantly surprised that we got 48 participants to take part. Um, and it seemed like there was a you know, fair bit of interest in, in this project. Uh, so our survey elicited both qualitative and quantitative responses. Um, and the topics were divided into five categories. The first topic, uh, role and experience, um, asked participants to, you know, talk about their role and experience working at the biosecurity organization. Um, our second category we called how many, and this is where participants were asked to provide details about their IRA productivity. And I'll share some of those results on the next slide. Uh, the third category uh, was major activities and types of work. So here we directed different questions to participants depending on their role um, and constructed a list of major activities with the help of our MPI research team. Um, so these were the activities that go into IMBRE production for both analysts and managers. And we asked uh, the participants to indicate the percentage of time that goes into each. Uh, fourth, and into the qualitative responses, um, we asked what challenges the participants thought were impeding the efficient production of uh, IRAs. And we asked them to list up to seven challenges and explain them. Um, and finally, we also asked the participants for their own ideas about how they think uh, we might improve the efficiency of this production process. Right, so the results of the survey um, allowed us to get a good deal of insight into those three questions that I posed on the earlier slide. Um, and a lot of these results are obviously very important to our research, but perhaps not overly interesting for this presentation. Um, so in terms of the quantitative data, uh, what might be interesting is the differences that we found between NZMPI and other organizations. Uh, so first, it turns out that NZMPI analysts are quite a bit more junior than their door counterparts, um, having only been on the job on average for about five years compared to door, which uh, analysts have been on the job for about 10. Um, in terms of productivity, uh, NZMPI on average commits about double the number of analysts to an IRA than DOOR does. Um, 
and I'm not going to speculate on why these these might be the case, but obviously there's quite a bit of difference between the biosecurity situations in, in NZMPI and other countries. Um, and you know that's probably probably going to explain a lot of a lot of the differences in this data. Um, so another another interesting result is that 50% of an analyst and manager's time is spent on the IRA production process. Uh, you know, going into this project, we knew that IRAs were a major component of what these organizations do, but having some uh, concrete data that puts a number on it is 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 interesting for us. Um, so when analysts are developing their IRAs, it turns out that searching for and digesting the relevant scientific literature takes about half of their time. And that's this is the same across organizations. Um, and uh, finally, another interesting difference we noticed was the amount of time it takes a manager to initiate an IRA at NZMPI compared with DOOR. 30% uh, for NZMPI managers compared with only 8% from DOOR. And this, again, probably reflects the different biosecurity situations and requirements for each country. Um, so as I said, the survey told us a lot more than actually what is presented here. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, this will all probably become available in this final report that will be released in a couple of months. So in terms of the qualitative data, uh, which is obviously very important to this project, um, I'll just briefly mention how it was analyzed. Uh, the survey asked participants to list and explain up to seven impediments to efficient IRA production. And the answers were given in free text. So we had to do some thematic coding uh, to get a sense of what was being said. Um, in total, there were 30 distinct challenges that we identified from the survey results, and I've just presented the, the top 10 here. Now, what's interesting is that by far the most frequently mentioned challenge uh, was getting access to the relevant scientific literature. And this came as, as quite a surprise to us. Uh, and I guess perhaps because uh, we're outsiders working at a university, we kind of take this, this access for granted. Uh, the next most frequently mentioned challenge was that information is often inaccurate, ambiguous, or missing. Um, and this is referring to the various databases that analysts draw on to get information, such as you know, information about previous assessments, regulatory statuses, et cetera. Um, another thing that's quite interesting about this is that for DOOR, it's not really such a problem having inf uh, inaccurate information or ambiguous information. Um, and we came to learn that uh, DOOR actually has a system for keeping their databases up to date and accurate, and um, that probably explains why it's not so much of an issue for them. So what about ideas? Um, here again, the responses were given as free text, so we had to do a bit of coding. Um, and what do we see? Well, we see that improving access to scientific literature uh, is the equal most mentioned idea. Uh, so we started to get some converging evidence that uh, this is a pretty big issue for biosecurity organizations. Uh, but for NZMPI, uh, the most frequently mentioned idea was building integrated databases. Uh, so as the name suggests, this is something like linking all the different databases that analysts draw on for their risk assessments and integrating them with whatever tools they're using to do those assessments. So, uh, Looking at the results of the survey, um, what should we suggest to MPI? Well, the number one seems obvious, uh, get better access to scientific literature, as almost all our data points to be this being the thing uh, that would improve efficiency the most. Um, and our second suggestion would be to develop and maintain integrated databases. Uh, there's not so much converging evidence, uh, but there's enough to justify the suggestion because it was mentioned a lot, and it would help resolve the second most frequently mentioned challenge, which was inaccurate and missing information. So that's what the survey suggests we should do. But our remit wasn't just to suggest two opportunities, it was to first map the opportunity space for MPI and then have them select two opportunities, one that could be piloted in the short term and one that would take longer to develop. Now, mapping the opportunity space wasn't just a matter of uh, presenting the results of the survey. Uh, I mentioned briefly earlier that the research team had their own ideas. Um, and Tim also mentioned that we were working with uh, Wendy Ogers, uh, who provided us with a list of what DOOR has tried 
um, and what has worked. So we had these three sources of opportunities. We had the research team, uh, we had DOOR, and we also had our survey results. And building this opportunity map um, was a matter of synthesizing the opportunities from our three different sources. And uh, we had a total of 56, but many of them overlapped, as you might expect. Um, so again, we had to do some coding and merging, after which we got 37 distinct opportunities. And we were able to divide them into eight categories listed here, uh, some relating to analyst productivity, some relating to management, other to organizational structure, and, and, and so on. And this is the result, and uh, hopefully it's not too small for you to see there. Um, this is uh, the overview of the opportunity map, and uh, all 37 opportunities are listed here uh, with the source of each and support from the survey if there was any. Um, the real opportunity map explains what each of these are, and again, that'll be available in the final report. Um, but this was, this, was one of the first, this was the first objective of the project to produce this map. Um, and we had managed to do that. But to fill the next objective, uh, MPI had to pick from these. And to do that, we had to come up with some sort of process. Uh, so first we convened a, a team uh, of MPI staff, which was about seven people, including some managers. Um, and we put together an exercise where all the opportunities in their map could be appraised by the team. Uh, we asked them to evaluate each opportunity under three dimensions. The first was possible efficiency gain. So how much would this opportunity improve efficiency? Uh, the second was feasibility, you know, how possible would it be to implement this opportunity? And finally, risk. Would the opportunity reduce the quality of work or increase the chance that an assessment might be incorrect? Now, this appraisal exercise wasn't supposed to yield statistically significant results. Rather, it was to indicate which opportunities uh, should be discussed at the next stage of the process, which was a workshop. Uh, so we convened a two hour workshop with the team uh, and discussed the results of the appraisal exercise. And then we deliberated on which two opportunities to pursue. And we recorded this deliberation using a, a dialogue mapping technique, uh, which is simply just diagrams the main points of the discussion and any decision reached. And the end result was uh, a decision on which two opportunities to pursue. But before we get there, I'll just show you what the results of this uh, appraisal were. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, they're consistent with our survey results. Uh, integrated databases and improving access to scientific literature received the highest scores when evaluated under those three dimensions. Um, but note that the top five are all rated pretty highly. Um, so we took these top five as our starting point for the for the workshop deliberation. Uh, <clears throat> so unexpectedly, the workshop revealed that uh, improving access to scientific literature and um, integrated databases were not what MPI wanted to pursue. Uh, templates were chosen as the actionable opportunity or the opportunity that could be uh, piloted within our time frame. Um, and a structured drafting environment was chosen as, as the long term one. And there are pretty good reasons for this, and some of some of which were, were we weren't aware of uh, prior to this workshop. So why wasn't uh, access to scientific literature chosen? Well, it turns out that improving access has quite a long history uh, of being tried at MPI. And there are certain roadblocks that are, are difficult to pinpoint um, that have prevented uh, much progress being made here. Uh, so while MPI thought it was uh, important to have the data that this is something that they need, uh, there existed all sorts of institutional blockages to getting it done, and it wouldn't be terribly efficacious of us to, to pursue that. And as it turns out, uh, MPI is already working on something like integrated databases, so there wouldn't really be much of a point on us doing the same thing. So constructing templates for IRAs, and specifically for pest risk analyses, which make up an IRA, it was a good choice for a few reasons. Uh, probably most important was that we could actually pilot them in our time frame, uh, but they would offer some efficiency gain, uh, be useful for those just starting out doing analyses, and properly constructed could help decision makers get the information they need easily. And finally, they link nicely with our long-term opportunity, the structured drafting environment, and Tim will speak to that a little later. Uh, 
so our templates would use this thing called case as the framework for their structure. And I'll speak a little bit more about what that is in a second. But just quickly, uh, the case schema is something that has been increasingly integrated into risk assessments at MPI and at DOOR. Um, so we're not really introducing something that's, that's totally foreign. They're, they're aware of what this is. Um, and these templates would also provide a good amount of detail and guidance for how to fill them in. Uh, they would be logically structured so the reader could easily see how assessments justified. And on the right here, this, uh, <clears throat> this uh, picture, uh, we've got a little visual of what a case formatted entry assessment looks like. And don't worry too much about it, it's, uh, it's quite a lot there, but we'll talk about the basics now. Uh, so what is case? Well, it is, it is itself a template for structuring arguments. And sometimes these things are also called argument schemes. Um, it stands for contention, argument, evidence, and source. And basically, that's how you structure your argument. Um, but it also contains some principles and rules that can make an argument robust and, and clearly communicated. So the basic structure looks like this picture on the right. A case structured argument always starts with a, a contention. And the contention is what you're arguing for. And this is a bit like other argument schemes where what you're arguing for or your conclusion uh, comes at the end. Now, nested directly beneath the contention is what we call the argument layer, or the reasons to believe the contention, or in the case of objections, the reasons to disbelieve the contention. And nested directly beneath that are specific items of evidence that support the reason. And each of these items should be appropriately sourced. And that's it, that's the most basic case structure. Uh, now, obviously, as reasoning becomes more complex, you need a lot more than what's presented here, but the structuring principles remain the same. The contention is supported by arguments, which can be supported by sub-arguments, and further sub-arguments, which at the very bottom are justified by specific items of evidence. And here we have the case principles in action on a section of the template that we've developed, and it's the, it's the one on the right. And I presented it here next to a template that MPI developed for a specific project. And our case template used this original one for a lot of the biosecurity content that we needed. And I'll just talk a little bit about what we see in this case template. We start with the contention, the likelihood a pest will enter is, is X, is high or low or whatever. And directly beneath the contention in bold is the top argument layer, which provides the first reason to believe that the likelihood is what it is. In an entry assessment, that reason is the likelihood that pests will remain undetected in post entry quarantine. And I I'll just specify uh, uh, in an entry assessment for this particular commodity, the main reason is that the pests will remain undetected in post entry quarantine. And nested directly underneath that first reason uh, is the next argument layer. And what we've tried to do here is extract the main factors that go into whether or not a pest will be detected in post entry quarantine. And these factors are whether the culture will show visible symptoms, sorry, whether the commodity will show visible symptoms, uh, whether the conditions in post-entry quarantine will be optimal for the expression of symptoms, and whether, if expressed, those symptoms are likely to be picked up. Now, nested directly underneath is the, uh, that second argument layer are the specific items of evidence that justify the layer above. And in our template, we provide examples of what these items of evidence might be. But when an analyst is using this template, they'll have to provide their own evidence. So these are just uh, hints or, or tips about what you might need to consider. Now, one of the main reasons that we structure an argument like this is so the reader can quickly and easily access the information they require. To see how the contention is supported at a high level, the reader only needs to consider the text involved. Is the likelihood, for example, low? Well, because the likelihood that the pest will be detected is high. And if applicable, the likelihood the pest will escape prior to cultures being released is, is low or, or moderate or whatever. Now, if the reader wants more information, they only need to look at the next layer of argument. Why is the likelihood of detection high? Because the pest should, should show visible symptoms. Conditions are optimal in post-entry quarantine for that symptom expression, and if expressed, those symptoms will be detected. And if the reader wants to know why, it is that the pest will show symptoms, they only need to look at the layer below that. And here we have the specific information that justifies why. 
Now, there's a bit more to how case has been implemented here, um, but this is the basic picture. That's that's how this is how our template looks pretty much. Um, okay, so how might this improve efficiency? Uh, well, it should expedite the drafting of PRA sections, uh, like for instance, say an entry assessment. Uh, the structure and the guidance would help analysts know what needs to be considered and how to organize uh, what needs to be considered in a, in a logical way. Um, second, it should also reduce the need for corrective feedback. A case format helps ensure that these sections are logically structured, that conclusions, or in our case, contentions, are consistent with the evidence, and assumptions are clearly stated and valid. And all three of these things are actually checks that reviewers make on, a, on an IRA to, uh, when, they're, when they're reviewing it. So if the case structure can help with those things, then there should be a reduced need for feedback, corrective feedback. Um, we also think that it'll reduce uh, some of the flack that comes back from stakeholders. And it'll do this by increasing the clarity of the assessment and thus leaving less room for misunderstanding or ambiguity. Um, and finally, if all pest risk assessments are drafted with this template, the whole IRA should be more consistent. Uh, so we're now piloting, as to mentioned, uh, the use of this template um, with our MPI working group, and they're using this on a on a project that they've just started, an IRA that they've just started. Um, now it's a pilot, not an experiment, um, so we're not going overboard with the data we collect, um, but we are going to gather qualitative feedback from those using the template and time data on how long it's taking them to do it. Um, we can then compare that with previous previous assessments. Um, and when these peer, uh, these pest risk assessments are reviewed, we'll get a chance to see if this template has indeed reduced the need for corrections. So we'll be getting this qualitative feedback and time data soon, uh, but the peer review data might take a bit later. And um, okay, actually that's my part done. I'll now hand over to Tim, who will talk about our long-term opportunity, uh, the structured drafting environment. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, so one thing that Ari didn't mention, if, if you go back to the previous slide, uh, Ari, um, or in fact, the previous one to that, the, uh, actually the previous one to that, sorry, that is what I really wanted. Yeah, okay, on the right, we've, we've got the example uh, uh, template. Now, Ari didn't mention that there's a certain amount of automation which becomes possible when you have a template like this. Uh, so where you can see, if you can read it, it's very small writing, uh, where you can see pest slash group name in brackets, and that's throughout the template. And uh, you know, something that, like that, you know, with a little bit of code can be automated so that it, it it's automatically set and it ripples through. And so you, you can save an analyst a certain amount of time just by doing some of the automated you know, drafting uh, right there in a template. And so we've implemented some simple uh, uh, macros and things and that's part of, the, of what's being piloted. Uh, if, if you now flip forward, um, and I mentioned that because that's a, a sort of a lead into this whole concept of a structured drafting environment. So the, um, the analogy here, as you can see, is uh, if you've used the ATO online system um, for, for preparing your tax return, you'll know how much better it is than uh, than filling out the old paper and pencil form, uh, and, uh, and 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 in fact, the form itself as a template is a lot better than just starting with an Excel spreadsheet and just starting to you know actually uh, you know figure out your taxes from from ab initio. Now, I, I use this analogy because when an today when an analyst sits down and to draft a PRA, PRA section. Uh, you know, they, they pull out Microsoft Word and they're a little bit like the person preparing their tax return with a spreadsheet, right? They, they have to create a lot of it, uh, you know, by manual drafting. And so the structured decision environment takes you all the way to the, uh, by analogy, the, the online tax return system, uh, where it's, it's you're, you're not in, it, in Microsoft Word any longer. You're in an online, uh, you know, you're a browser-based uh, platform. And it's all very structured, 
And uh, there's still some serious analytic work, some thinking to do, but uh, but there's a, a great deal of of scaffolding in in a dedicated structured drafting environment like this that could help expedite analy the the analyst pr uh, production. So uh, that's the concept. Now we are in the process of mocking up a structured drafting environment for IRAs. Uh, now that it'll be nothing more than a Potemkin village type of, of thing uh, that illustrates uh, in, a, in an early kind of design concept for what, what a structured drafting environment would be. Uh, but uh, that uh, we'll have some screenshots and things um, in the final report. Uh, what we speculate is that this is the kind of thing that could make a major shift um, in, in productivity. Uh, without diminishing quality. And uh, and why do we think that? Well, if you flip to the next slide, Ari, uh, click again. Okay, w one reason, for example, um, is, oh, well, I, that, that was meant to be, you know, a, a, a slow reveal, but <laughs> there it is, there are all the, the seven things. Uh, we, we might even start with number seven since it's already there. Uh, it's, uh, you, would, you know, as an analyst drafting a, a PRA, you wouldn't be, uh, you know, you'd lose all that time you spend messing around, you know, the heading formatting right and, you know, just all the annoying little things about using Microsoft Word and and all the, the, the other futzing around that happens when you're trying to get your references right and you're trying to integrate PRA sections into a big IRA and so forth. I think everybody's familiar with the kinds of nightmares that you can have. I'm a big fan of Microsoft Word, but I acknowledge, um, you know, there are some real uh, you know, sometimes you can really waste a lot of time uh, just mucking around, uh, wrestling with Word. So going up back to the top, um, you know, when you do your tax return online and the, 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 uh, what the ATO does for you is it grabs a whole lot of information from other databases and pre-populates your, your tax return. And that's a great, that's a, that's a, a wonderful help, right? It saves a lot of time. Uh, and uh, so... It can update that information when it changes in the databases. It can do a certain amount of cross-checking for consistency and error checking. So, you know, first up, that's a pretty obvious gain. Um, if your structured drafting environment is part of your larger suite of integrated databases. Um, uh, secondly, uh, we can integrate these much more detailed uh, case type templates into the drafting environment. So, so they can be there right there, you know, and, and again, pre-populated and so forth. Um, another exciting possibility is, is that since the, uh, this structured drafting environment in a sense knows what you're trying to achieve, it can go out from the moment it knows what pest and what commodity and, you know, it can actually go out and start doing. You have bots that can go out and start uh, actually doing some of the research that's relevant uh, and actually pre-prepare that so it's already sort of, you know, you just open up the, the environment at the right spot and uh, you'll have, you know, part of your screen will be the, the, the pre-searched for research that's relevant to, to drafting that particular section. Uh, automated reference management as, as part and parcel of this whole system. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the idea of this environment is it's, it's for drafting the entire IRA and assembling that out of the many, many sections. So it, it can pull it all together for you, making sure it's all consistently formatted and so forth. Uh, it, uh, it potentially it could integrate process management, like you know, uh, is have you finished a draft? Is it has it been reviewed? Um, you know, sign off and so forth. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've talked about fussing around with words. So so those are at least some of the ways we think that you could get really substantial gains if you had something like what the ATO's got uh, to help millions of people prepare their tax returns. Now, um, uh, look, I know that um, it's, it's fairly obvious it, this is not an easy thing, right? This is a major effort. Uh, you know, developing such a thing is, it would be a major development. It would take, you know, probably a couple of years minimum, you know, to really get it sorted and developed and, and, and quite a bit of money. So this is not an easy option, um, but it does, from everything we've done in this project, it looks like it is sort of the way forward for, for major uh, for major gains. And uh, one last thing I'll say about it is it opens up 
it, it, it opens the pathway to the uh, longer term future uh, where uh, they cut off somehow. But, um, you know, the, once you've got a structured drafting environment, more and more of that activity can be taken over by AI tools. And uh, there, there's sort of a, a um, you know, there's, there's a kind of a mid to long term future where, where more and more uh, of the actual pre preparation of, of IRAs is done in an automated AI way and analysts uh, are much more uh, quality control, you know, review, quality control, just, you know, making sure it's all, uh, you know, being done correctly. Uh, and also, you know, the human side of, of the whole development and communication of IRAs. So uh, that's, the, that's the vision. Um, we don't have much to say about the AI side of it um, at, at the moment, but we all know that that's coming down the, uh, the highway. Uh, to every form of knowledge work and biosecurity risk analysis is is no different uh, is not going to be exempt from that so um, so that's our presentation um, thanks for uh, sort of listening and uh, we have a, a bit of time I think for some discussion excellent, excellent. hoping you can hear me there yeah I might just turn my camera off to make sure it makes it easier. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Gelder and Dr. Kruger. That was um, brilliant. And I, I won't touch on the AI side of things. That's uh, probably a bit sensitive in terms of uh, the sheer amount of work and processes associated with it. But um, absolutely agree around the benefits of even just having structured drafting processes and, and the benefits that can provide for the next lot of innovation and work that, that we need to um, need to consider. Now I know we've got quite a few people online and I think I can just see Jason's uh, stimulated the uh, chat function there as well. Have we got any questions? Does anyone want to um, fire away? Okay, here we go. Um, we'll just go in order as they come through. So we'll start with Alan Sheridan there. Um, how do you see the new systems helping in dealing with the problem of evidential dissonance? Uh, Ari, do you have a quick thought, sir? Um, I'm not quite sure what they mean by evidential dissonance. If I could pop in, Ari, it's Alan Sheridan here. I work in animal biosecurity. It's where you've got oh, yeah. publications from different sources that seem to be saying different things about how a pest or disease is actually spread uh, with relevance to the biosecurity import pathways. Um, yeah. So currently, I don't, I don't think anything that we've done touches on that specifically. At the moment, um, it seems like MPI deal with this evidential dissonance uh, by incorporating into their assessment of uncertainty. Um, so if there's a, if the sources are saying different things, um, that turn, that makes the uh, the conclusion of the assessment more uncertain. Um, so our our templates can help with how that little section about uncertainty is drafted, but in terms of um, solving the problem, uh, I'm not too sure we have much to say about that. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Um, this one from Grant uh, in slide 10, which I, I can't see there, but um, there was a big difference in stakeholder engagement between the MPI and DOOR. Um, any comments on why and is there a risk um, that more efficient processes will decrease stakeholder engagement? Uh, so stakeholder engagement difficulties as a challenge um, to efficient IRA production. Um, yeah, there does seem to be a big difference between DOOR and NZMPI. I, I'm not, I, I wouldn't really want to speculate on, on why that is because I'm, I think they have completely different processes for how they deal with stakeholders. Um, yeah. So again, I'm not, I'm not too sure I had too much to say about that unless Tim does. Uh, is that slide 10, uh, Ari? Oh, that it is. is. Yeah, 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 I see it is. Um, I, I do recall that uh, the door has something that MPI doesn't have, which is a uh, more of the stakeholder engagement is actually handled in door by a dedicated stakeholder engagement team, much more. 
than, than in, in the MPI, and, and consequently more of the stakeholder engagement. So, stakeholder engaging with stakeholders takes more time for analysts at MPI because they have to do it rather than that other team. Uh, but the uh, but beyond that, I, I, look, I, I no, I don't have any more detailed insight into that difference. Uh, well played. Uh, one question there from Anna Groves. Uh, oh, actually, it's been answered by Sarah. Uh, has yeah. New Zealand MPI implemented the interactive template? Uh, well, it, it's in it's in process. That so is, it's being piloted. So yeah, there are analysts actually working with it as almost as we speak. Excellent. Yeah, I think um, some of the responses are coming through we, with um, the answers as well, Dr. Gilda. But um, keep them keep them coming along. Um, uh, we've got one here from it looks like it's uh, Leslie De Bono. I've experienced writing similar tools, uh, browser-based chemical assessment tools, e.g., mm -hmm. um, for ecotoxicological um, studies. An unexpected downside was that analysts could become too rigid in their thinking and rely too much on the tools. Have you had this problem and how have you tackled it? Yes, so look, I, I so that's that's just a very interesting observation because um, what's what's it, it's interesting to know the sort of the net effect, right? Um, you know, there there are going to be benefits, and sometimes there are going to be perhaps unexpected disadvantages of such a thing. Uh, I'd be really, we'd, uh, Ari and I'd be very interested to hear more about your experience there, and and perhaps even to get a look at those tools that 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 you're describing. Uh, the since we haven't tried building this system. I mean, it, it, we're, we're really just fleshing out the concept and, and, and you know, recommending it as a path forward. Um, so we don't have direct experience of those unintended side effects as yet. Yeah, thank you. And this one, uh, Tim, is for you. I'm not sure if you saw it. It was from Craig Phillips and he goes, my understanding is that updating or revising existing PRAs is also time consuming. Uh, potentially with backlogs of work, and it seems that SDEs could also be valuable for more quickly updating old PRAs. Uh, yeah, that's. I, th I think that's just just a good point. Um, it's it's not limited to producing. It's also uh, the, the so. I, I think one thing that emerges here is the, the potential for uh, these IRAs and PRA subsections to be more what they call live documents. Now, I know that they can't be fully live. They can't be just be changing the whole time. You know, uh, there has to be review and, and so forth. But nevertheless, we're shifting from a model of you produce it, it's written, it's printed, and it sits on the shelf and it just gets stale um, uh, with, with sort of occasional uh, review uh, to a, a more of a, um, a, a thing that exists as a continually updatable um, entity. So uh, that that I think is is the vision there. Yeah, uh, thank I, you. So I just mentioned uh, that on that topic of um, updating quickly, uh, reviewing and uh, uh, old PRAs. There is actually another separate project this year working with Door on the on the that whole that whole activity. Thanks, and, and this is just more of a comment going back to what we were talking about before from uh, Alison Roach in that there is also a number of differences structurally between Australia and uh, New Zealand, including that we have states and territories to consult with, as well as industry bodies. But I mean, um, I, I think that's, that's a given. Now we've got one from Shola here. Um, if your respondents from MPI were risk analysts, it would explain why they didn't think stakeholder engagement was that much of a problem. Um, there, there might also be some limitations in terms of stakeholder engagement that sits with the imports team that use the risk assessment to develop standards. Uh, thanks for that corrective. In fact, in, in what I said previously, I think I flipped the organisations around. So thanks, Shola. Yep, perfect, perfect. All right. Any more questions or any more hands up? I can see. Uh, I'm just sorry, trawling through. I think I might have missed a couple there, so I'll just go back to make sure 
I think a few people have gone back on um, Alan Sheridan's original points. Um, I've got Christy Nags here. Um, Alan's original question was, how do you see the new systems helping in um, dealing with the problem of evidential dissonance? Um, yes, I am um, I come from a, a different area um, within DOOR and I'm just trying to um, broaden my horizons a little bit and open my eyes to what's happening in other disciplines in the science area. And I'm a science policy person. Um, there's an issue there of um, getting access to scientific literature and making sure everyone is on board with best practice, new practice science. And um, it's something that we struggle with. My heart sank when you said it's, it's almost uh, in the too hard basket because it's infinitely expensive. But um, in other areas of science field, there's a high degree of contestability. For example, um, marine science with uh, water runoff and whatnot. Um, and I do think, you know, in policy land, and I only say this because I used to be an analyst in a different area, um, the mis what people think intelligence is. So the reports, I think, uh, is there a caveat or is there a, like limitations of the analysis that come up in the template? So should it fall, should it fall into a policy person's hands? <laughs> they know how to interpret it correctly, that it's an intelligence report. It is not a statement necessarily of fact. Yeah, I'll just I'll just comment brief briefly a, a little bit more about that. So uh, nothing that we're we're doing kind of it, it, it's going to make the analyst's job a little bit easier, but the analyst is still going to have a big part in it. And when it comes to evidential dissonance, I I think it's really going to be still up to the analyst to to weigh up what the different scientific literature is saying and 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 reach a conclusion on it. Um, so we're not really we're not really ha uh, taking that activity away from the analyst. In fact, I think. No matter what we do, that'll still come down to the individual expertise and, and skills of the, of the analysts. Agreed. I, you know, there's some things that are yet that just aren't. There's some things that aren't replaceable. Hmm. AI is just not there yet. Yeah. No, I, I think it goes back to one of the other points we're talking about, getting all these sort of instead of stovepiped, um, you know, systems and data sets, getting them at least integrated to then build on that and then to use the AI ML to, you know, further benefit um, and, and find insights and, and further improvements. There's only about five minutes uh, left or less actually, but um, I think we've just got a couple of other comments there, but just while we're doing that, I can, um, uh, I know we've got a few door people on the line here, but um, this sort of approach would also be a benefit to um, our bars and TARP workflows in terms of having integrative live um, IRA workflows. I could see an absolute um, massive benefit there as well, but um, I don't want to be too contentious. Um, uh, one of the other ones, questions here, just if I can round out was, um, how flexible can the structured templates be? The information required in the PRAs for one IRA may differ from that needed um, in other projects due to differences in commodities, pathways, etc. Yeah, that, that's a that's a very um, pertinent, insightful kind of point. And it's, it's, we are actually grappling with that, you know, at this stage of the project. So the the template that Ari showed was a pretty detailed and and commodity specific template it you know to, to really get that structure to work you had to think about what are the arguments that are relevant for that particular type of commodity right? and so uh, therefore it doesn't really work that well for a lot of other things uh, and so there's a granularity issue if, if you have to tailor your templates in a, in a lot of detail to every different commodity then you might end up spending as much time as you might save just tailoring your template and so maybe it's a it's a wash, you know, it's no gain. Uh, so that's a pretty serious issue, and it, and it is very relevant to the design of the structured drafting environment. It, it is something that Ari and I, you know, have, have been um, discussing, and, and we're playing with different ideas about um, uh, how what's the level of granularity or specificity uh, 
around this and uh, or do you offer multiple levels? Uh, all I can say at this stage is that th those are challenges and we're, we're, we're trying out different concepts to try to deal with that deep problem. Yeah, I'll also just add that um, we're very much in, in a pilot stage. So what we want to do first is to see if this general approach is going to work for a specific commodity. Um, and if it does, then we might be able to make some adjustments to see if we'll work from another commodity. Um, and after we've done this a few times, I think we'll have enough to compare what is, um, what's general enough to go into multiple commodities and what's specific enough that it needs to be uh, tailored for each individual commodity. Um, so we've, I think we're just at the very beginning stages of, of trying to work this out. I can see uh, Jess's uh, got their hand up, so far away. There's only a couple of minutes left. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, so I uh, just have a quick question on uh, slide number nine. So I was just looking into uh, the, the calendar months and analyst months spent on these IRAs. If you look into the other countries, I'm interested to see what the USDA and CFA are doing. See, they're only using four or five months to produce an IRA uh, in terms of analyst hours and managers hour. Did you investigate why is that? Are they producing something different from what we in Australia do? Uh, no, we didn't investigate that. Um, and I'll just mention, I'll just go back to this slide. So in terms of other, we only actually had eight respondents. So for all these other um, agencies that are listed here, it was probably just one or two people. Um, so when we look at this data, it was more useful for us to lump it all together. So what the individual organizations are doing um, is not displayed on, on this table. And no, we didn't investigate why uh, it appears to be different for those organizations. Um, again, we were just kind of mainly interested in what NZMPI and to a lesser extent DOOR had to say about it, but it's an interesting question. No, thank you. Like, you know, you're comparing 13 months to four months, so that's why I was like, um, they might be either doing a very good job or they're not at all doing any job. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> or it's just very no noisy data. Yeah. Thanks very much, Jess, for that question as well. I don't think we've got anything else um, coming through. And just noting the time, I might just um, wrap it up there. But uh, Dr. Van Gelder and, and Dr. Kruger, did you have contact details just in case anyone wanted to get in contact? Uh, um, yes. There we go. Yeah. It was on. Yep, perfect. So I'll just leave that up while we're doing it. And also just a, a thank you. I could see. Um, our New Zealand MPI uh, research colleagues have joined us and been online and thank you in particular to um, Sarah Sabsford who has been helping with responses there. So excellent. Thank you very much again um, to everyone for joining, Dr Van Gelder and Dr Kruger in particular. Um, it was a, a brilliant presentation, very informative and uh, stimulated lots of conversation there. Um, for those of you who are taking note, the next seminar is scheduled for Thursday, 28th of July, and it will feature research undertaken in the use of rubrics and other methods in qualitative evaluation. But um, thank you all um, for joining us today. I hope you have an excellent rest of your day and um, we'll leave it there. Thank you all. Okay, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Cheers.